Well, it's great to be here and good morning. It's actually a very good discussion. I was interested in hoping I can tie this all together and uh, move forward. Because what we do is, a lot people um, alluded to iTree, we build computer simulation systems to understand what urban forests do. But the question is, I think what we want to wrap this up is, is not what, is where do you want to be? You envision Dublin, or wherever you are, 50 years from now, the question is, how are you going to get there? You, you are where you are. You can look back at the past, it's very interesting to see the past in this. And, and Christy, you alluded to engineering. The question is, what I want to go through today is, and speakers before us have talked about this, about the environmental services, is how do the trees provide that? You can use green infrastructure or urban forest, whatever you want to call it, to re-engineer cities. The question is, if you understand what they do, you can do a better job and how they do it. But also, the, some of the questions before that is, step one, and, and Gerald, you're getting to this, is what do you have? You have to have a starting point to say, here's what we have today. Here's what it does. Get that discussion going, the collaboration of understanding what the resource is. And then begin the discussions about where do you want to be in the future by understanding how the system works. So what you have on this, this tree cover map is going to be very important. So everybody said this from the beginning, just so we're on the same page. To, to, from the perspective that we take, the urban forest is everything, all the green infrastructure, all the trees within the city. It's not just one component. We want to look at the whole city system from the public trees to the private trees and look at everything together. This is from uh, Tinney gave me these numbers for the greater Dublin area uh, using iTree Canopy. I think he did like 1,500 points. So you have about 19% tree cover in greater Dublin. You said about 10% within Dublin itself. That's your starting point. You have a certain amount, I think you said about 38% impervious cover, then you have grass space. That's, that's your structure today. The question is how are you going to change that and redesign it if you want to improve that by understanding what you have uh, in, into the future. So that's your starting point. So it's a management journey. Your starting point is what you have today and you want to envision where you want to be into the future. And that's what hopefully what we can guide this in this process to, to get this discussion going. The key here is structure is critical, and that's what we just talked about. Uh, Gerald, you have that map of tree cover, which locates the trees. The eye tree canopy only says the total amount. It doesn't say where it is. You're putting the trees where they are. Structure is what you have. How many trees? How many, what are the species? What's the health of the trees? Where are they located? Those are the physical elements of the environment. You have to start with that, and you're already getting to that. Those, that structure provides various services, and a lot of speakers before me have talked about these various services, and I'll talk a little bit more in depth about them. And that service has value to society. So if you want to optimize value for the future society, you have to step back and say, how am I going to change the structure? And that's what this is all about, and get that dialogue and a collaboration going to how are we going to change the way we do business today to change the structure for a better tomorrow, which will then enhance values and increase health for everybody. It's all about leaf area. It's not about the number of trees. And I think your data show this, a London plane tree. The reason the London plane tree has the most carbon and is, does the greatest on the service is they're the biggest ones out there. And they have to be healthy trees. Dead trees have no leaves. The question is how are you going to distribute this leaf area because that's the functional part of the tree that does most of the services. Big trees do a lot more than small trees because they have a lot more leaves and they pr produce a lot more services. Tied to that, you also have water. You have to have water to these trees. If the, water, if the tree shut down into a drought period, you lose that capacity of that gas exchange. So it's all about engineering elements. These are biological elements that change the environment because they're doing certain services to that. And basically, if you understand the physics of this, you can change the environment. With that, I'm going to give you my top 10. Christy talked about various ones. Johan talked about various ones. I'm going to go through my top 10 in, uh, services of why we should have trees in cities in terms of um, improving human health and environmental quality in cities. So I ask you to think about what your top 10 are, because sometimes you come up with better ones than I do. And these are mine in sequence. Number 10, oxygen production. Every school child knows that they're taught the trees produce oxygen. I put this one on here because I throw this out. This has absolutely no value to urban society. And it's counterintuitive. We all have to breathe. Trees produce a lot of oxygen. For every, for basically in the gas exchange, when trees take in carbon through carbon dioxide, they give off oxygen. So a growing tree sequesters carbon, gives off oxygen. A decaying tree consumes oxygen and gives off carbon dioxide through decomposition. It's a net balance system. But a healthy forest that's growing is producing a lot of oxygen. Why don't trees, or why don't trees have any value then? They produce enough oxygen to offset, I think we calculated the United States, 
Officer the oxygen consumption of two-thirds of the U.S. population, the trees and cities. Producing millions of tons of oxygen. It's worth nothing. You have to put it in perspective where you're at. So we have about 67 million tons of oxygen being produced. The answer lies in two various factors. Most of the atmosphere is oxygen already. 21% is oxygen. Lack of production of more oxygen into this means nothing. Well, no one's going to suffocate if all the plants in the world die. We'll have other problems. But we're not going to die. Suffocation is not the immediate problem. Also, 90, over 90% 90 of the world's oxygen production comes from oceans. So I think what we need to do, I, I throw this one out here as my number 10 ones. So we need to shift the argument to where trees really have the impact, where it's really out, important for human health. Oxygen production is not important for human health, but there are many attributes, and Johan mentioned a few of them, that affect human health. And we need to get onto those. Affecting oxygen in the atmosphere is not that important. It's affecting that sliver there which is the trace gases, carbon dioxide, particulate matter, things like that, ozone, is where the trees are going to have a very big importance because they're going to have a very a small marginal change in a small fraction has a big impact on human health. A small change in the big factor doesn't do that much. Number nine, products and jobs. This has to do with a couple things. Uh, Fruit and nut production, if you want to feed, we were asked to do, when we were asked to do I tree to the Fruit and, Agricul Fruit and Agriculture Organization of the UN, they, didn't, they were worried about third world countries and so they don't care about pollution removal. They don't care about human health, well, directly about that. They want to know about food. People have to eat. They want to know how much food's being produced from the forest, not how much gas is being removed by the forest. So it's all in your perspective of where you're at. Food production is part of this process. But also at the end, when the forest is removed, we have a lot of biomass. What do you do with the trees? Trees are not there forever. They grow and they die. And at the, end, at the end of the lifespan, what do you do with all that biomass? Often what we do in the United States is we, it's a wastewood product. How do you get rid of it? We chip it up and give it by the side of the roadside. The other way is, I mean, it costs money to manage the urn forest. Why not return that, like we do in forest production? We produce timber. There's a lot of biomass. We estimate, uh, we have 1.3 billion tons of dry weight biomass in our country which produces about 26 million tons of waste each year, which then is a cost to get rid of. Why not convert that into a benefit stream back to the city and either sell it back, use it for ethanol, food, fuel production, pallets, wood pellets, use it. And a lot of our problems, we burn fossil fuels. Why not reburn that wood back into the system, reducing our energy consumption? Because Gerald showed that slide of how much CO2 comes out of cities. Instead of using fossil fuels, use some natural regeneration. So we need to think about the whole city system of the forestry, trees coming in and trees going out. There's potentially a lot of wood. There's potentially a lot of nutrients. So what do we do when the trees drop their leaves? Well, we do in the United States. We rake them up, put them, put them in bags, whatever, and get rid of them off the site. And then what do we do in the springtime? We call Chemlon to come in and fertilize because we don't have any nutrients. Well, there's tons of nutrients in the leaves themselves that are just being pushed off site. So then we use man-made chemicals to bring it back in to to put more nutrients back to the site. So we need to think about the cycle of this. There's time involved with this, trees grow and die, and all these chemicals and mass are being moved around. Maybe we can do this more efficiently and not have to spend so much and get more money back into the system. Number eight, noise reduction. Do trees actually reduce noise? Yeah. They, they, the soil is actually better at reducing noise. You get the soil down into the duff layer, the, the mulch on the ground, it, good at reducing. Trees more mask noise, deflect noise, and, and, and visually change noise. So noise is often psychological. If I do not see the source of the noise, I perceive less sound. Even though I'm hearing the same amount of sound, if I put a visual blockage between me and the roadway, psychologically it sounds quieter to me because I don't see the road. So trees, just by masking the roadways, has a psychological change. Two, they tend to deflect noises. They can absorb some, but they tend to deflect it so it changes direction. They also mask noise, because there's a psychology behind sound. Wind rustling through trees is a pleasant sound that people hear. So they like that. Birds chirping in the trees. There's a psychology of this sound. So noise is important because cities tend to be noise. We, we generate a lot of sounds through various attributes. But thinking about how we design to visually block sound, uh, sound or how we um, can mask sounds become important. One of the most interesting things to me is after, 
I think Hurricane Hugo went through, I think it was North Carolina. I asked, I asked someone after that, because they lost a lot of the forest to stand, I said, what was the most important thing that uh, changed in your environment? And they said sound, which I didn't expect that at all. I expected it to be some visual thing. And they said, no, there's sounds that I heard that I've never heard before, freeways that were miles and miles away of traffic that I never heard before that was buffered by the forest that existed, that was lost in that period. So the change of uh, the uh, acoustic environment is very important in terms of trees. We do not know the value of what that is. It's very tough to model that, but there is a whole psychology behind this. But if you understand that, but by understanding how sound works and how people's brains perceive sound, you can make better designs. Number seven, wildlife habitat. This is one, I think, is one of the most tangible benefits that people can see. They like wildlife. They associate with wildlife. We don't know the value. There's a huge industry of about feeding wildlife. I feed birds in my backyard. People like to enhance wildlife habitat. And there's much to this. We're starting to do more into this, but it's very locally specific because it has to do with forests and the local wildlife habitats that you have. Um, again, we don't know the value to this. Number six, this is where we get more into the, these last six are more into engineering and, and uh, changing the environment. Reductions in UV radiation. We're talking here about is increases the thinning of the high level ozone layer due to chlorofluorocarbons, that thinning of the ozone layer. So particularly in Australia and southern hemispheres in the springtime, that hole opens up. You get more of this shortwave radiation coming in. Leads to skin cancer, cataracts. That's why you have the sun protecting factors. You might have a big, as much of a problem here in Ireland, but in southern United States, we have to put the suntan lotion on to protect from skin cancer, things like this. Well, trees do the same things. They act like a sun protection factor. Tree leaves absorb 95% of ultraviolet radiation. All right, so if you're standing in the, this has to do again with design. If you're trying to protect certain populations that are exposed to sunlight, particularly what we think about is designing schoolyards where children might be out playing, is try to shade them. So the question, and I asked this one yesterday, so don't give the answer if you were in my lecture yesterday. But if you're standing, think about this. If you, if you take a lawn chair and you're in the middle of a field and you sit in the, in the shadow of a tree on a sunny day and tree leaves absorb 95% of ultraviolet radiation, what percent radiation reduction do you think you're getting by sitting in the shadow of that tree? Any guesses on that? It's actually only about 50%. So the question is why? This is understanding, again, the physics of the system and if you're going to design. Why, if trees are absorbing 96 or 95 percent of ultraviolet radiation, if I'm sitting in the shadow of a tree on a sunny day, am I not getting 100 percent reduction in UV radiation? It has to do with what you're seeing in here, the blue sky. UV is reflecting off of various particles in the atmosphere, so it's not all coming from the direct beam of the sun. It's coming from blue sky. So you want to design, if you're protecting for human health, you want to design not only blocking the sun, but blocking the sky. Because half of it's coming from the sky view. This gets to, again, about designing elements. And the reason I tell you this, if you understand how it works, and you take the maps that you're producing, and looking at the human populations of who's being exposed, you might design differently in a schoolyard than you would along the riparian zone, or maybe certain areas. So how you design this forest is understanding what the forest is doing. This is a blocking of light, but not only blocking the sun, but also having to block the sky view. So we get that backscattering. We do not know the value of that. Actually, we're building a UV radiation program right now in Dietry to look at this and try to look at exposure to human populations relative to uh, tree canopy. Number five, greenhouse gas reduction. It has to do with climate change. Gerald showed some numbers on this from Dublin. Pretty much the, the general rule here is this is one of the easiest services to, to measure from a forest in terms of sequestration is that half of the dry weight of a tree comes from carbon from the atmosphere. So if you would see a tree getting bigger, it has taken carbon out of the atmosphere because it's converted the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere into the biomass of that tree. Of all the other ones, some of these other ones are very difficult to model or understand. This one I can directly measure. It. It's right there, I can see it. If the tree's gotten bigger, I've sequestered carbon. Uh, and you can show, you show that with the London plane tree. Now the problem with this, as compared to other services, is so, I forgot your numbers for what you had for, for Dublin, but I mean our numbers are, we're talking millions of tons of, of wood stored, and as the trees grow each year, they sequester more carbon, they take in the carbon dioxide, give off oxygen, and store that carbon in the wood. So as the trees get bigger, they're taking out more carbon on an annual basis. 
which is what you, you were showing, that summertime effect uh, from the flux towers is the trees are taking in that carbon during the summertime, which is offsetting some of the auto emissions. The question on this, if you think about this from a time perspective though, city of Dublin, you have all this carbon stored in the city. What happens when that tree dies? Where does the carbon go? I was alluding to that partly with the products. So what do we do, at least in our, our country, what do we do? We take that tree down, now it's, 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 it's removed from the system, we run it through the chipper, chip it all up, now what are we doing? We're accelerating the release of the carbon that this tree took 50 to 100 years to store, and, or we burn it, which is okay if we burn it for fuel, because then we're offsetting fossil fuel use, but if we just burn it, all the carbon that this tree has taken out of the atmosphere, or most of the carbon that this tree has taken out of the atmosphere over the last 50 to 100 years is given back to the, to the atmosphere. So how do you solve that? Trees are basically carbon cyclers. They take carbon in, we're, we're the same way. Our body's composed of carbon. When we die, the carbon goes back. Trees are doing the same thing. So how, do you, how can you solve that? One is you can see around this room. You can store some of it in wood products, which then will still delay the, the uh, removal of the carbon back to the atmosphere. The other option, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is take the carbon and burn for energy. Use, if you're up to the carbon, you're going to lose that carbon eventually. Utilize that carbon as a resource to offset the problem, which is the carbon emissions in the first place coming from burning of oil and things like this. Again, the, the point of this is we need to think larger scale and more systematically. It's not all about trees just storing carbon. It's about the time series of what happened from the past carbon and what's going to happen to the future carbon. Number four, water quality improvement. And this includes also flooding within that. And people have talked about this. The basic process here is probably twofold in some ways. You have leaves out there. When it rains, the leaves go onto the water for a little bit, and then the water runs off and it goes into the soils. For the most part, under heavy rain events, trees have very a relatively small impact. If you take a fire hose to a tree and run the water on it, most of that water is going to blow right through that canopy. But in the light rain events, trees have a significant impact, and most rain events are light rain events. They intercept that water and prevent the water from going into the, the soil system. Two is in the heavy rain events, the trees slow down the rate which the water is hitting the ground, therefore allowing the soils beneath the tree to infiltrate the water to infiltrate into the soils. So the problem that we have with flooding and the problem we have with water quality is the water is not getting into the soils. It's creating runoff on the surfaces and taking the pollutants that are on the surfaces and running them to the stream. So we have two problems in urban areas. One is we put the impervious surfaces down, which we have to have <laughs> buildings and roads, which do not allow water to infiltrate into the soils. Trees are not really going to solve that problem because we're going to need that infrastructure. If you plant trees over impervious surfaces, though, you can help reduce some of that runoff or allow more time for, say, let's say, street sweepers to come in and clean that surface before that, uh, those pollutants will wash off into, this, into these stream systems. Impervious surfaces are the main culprit behind the water issues that we have in cities. Trees will help a little bit, but if I had one choice of what to pick, if I could take up 1% break up 1% of impervious cover or plant 1% additional tree cover, I would break up the impervious surfaces. There'd be, it'd be, it's a no-brainer. Trees will have an impact. But the relative difference between impervious surfaces versus trees on water is about a 10 to 12 to 1 ratio, which means for every 1% impervious cover that you add to an area, you'd have to add about 10 to 12% canopy cover to offset the impact of that 1% impervious. Because the impervious, what's happening, if you seal that soil, you're not allowing that water to get into the soil. So where does it have to go? We usually pipe it to get it off the system, so then it flushes it into the stream rather rapidly. The problem with water quality and, and water flow issues is trying to, we're not getting enough water into the soil system. And we're going to have more and more issues with climate change going on where the rain intensities are going to change where we have, and we're seeing this in the states already, the, we're getting more precipitation but it's not so much the total, it's, it's, it's the duration when it comes in, it's more of these heavy rain events. My house flooded for the first time ever like three years ago just because we had such an intense rain. I'm on top of a hill and I had water running into my basement door because it, it couldn't saturate, the soil couldn't take it up fast enough. So we want to get that water into the soils, and the more we put impervious surfaces down, the less we're getting the water into the soils, and the more we're pushing it to the streams at a faster rate. So trees do have an impact. They also take up nutrients. 
and they also dry out the soil. So when they're evaporating water, it creates, it removes the water from the soil into the atmosphere, which creates more airspace for the next rain event, because the soils are not saturated as much to allow that water to percolate in. So the, if you think about it, trees are just basically pumps of water. They, they take in carbon, give off oxygen, and they pump out water constantly and are drying out the soils, which is an important attribute when we get to some of the other benefits, and this is one of them here. Air quality improvement. Again, it's all about the leaves. You have two attributes that are going on. When the stomates on the leaves, the little holes in the bottom of the leaves, open up to allow water to evaporate out, at the same time, if you think about it, if you take it, uh, when the stomates open, there's more pollution outside the leaf than inside the leaf. And inside the leaf, there's a lot of water. So basically, you're creating a concentration gradient. You may have ozone at a high concentration outside the leaf, it diffuses inside the leaf, and then it's taken up inside the leaf surfaces. So we have these basically filters, millions of leaves out there that are constantly exchanging gases. As they're, that's why you need water to get that, that, keep the stomates open. The pollutants are moving, the gaseous pollutants are moving into the leaves and are being removed. For the most part, they are not harmful. Actually, sulfur and nitrogen can act as a fertilizer. Sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide actually help the trees grow. Ozone will damage the leaf. Carbon monoxide is not taken up that much. So we have a constant source of, of pollution being removed. If you think about it, during the daytime when it's not raining and the, and the rain's removing it, who else, what else is taking up air pollution besides the trees? It's you and me. We're going to either breathe it in or they're going to breathe it in. The more they're breathing it in, the less you're going to be breathing it in. For particles, it's a little bit different. The fine particulate matter, PM 2.5, particulate matter less than 2.5 microns, or the small dust, those are the ones that stay retained in the atmosphere a long <coughs> period of time. They don't settle out very well, and they go deep into our lung system. It's these really tiny yeah. particles. They can be captured on the surfaces of the leaves. So conifers are very good because they offer year-round protection, or evergreen trees offer year-round protection. Uh, surface textures, such as hairy leaves, sticky leaves, the more the particles get and stick to the surface, the better off you're going to have. Does the particle stay on the surface forever? The answer is no. The ultimate resting place for particles is going to be the soil. Two ways. Leaves drop during the, uh, in the, in the winter time. Any particles that are on the leaves then move to the soil. But more importantly, when it rains, the rain washes the particles off the leaves and moves them to the soil. Most of the particles are water soluble and they dissolve. Some are not. And these are the ones with the problems. Heavy metals, pieces of lead, cadmium, zinc, do not dissolve in water, and some polyaromatic hydrocarbons do not dissolve, and they move to the soil system. So what's happening there, and this is a little bit different than gases, is particles, if they don't dissolve, are not being removed from the system. Trees are removing them from the air and transferring them to the soil. And if you think about it environmentally, then you've got another issue, and this is happening in cities in Europe, it's already being shown, and in the United States. Around the base of trees, we're getting high concentrations of these pollutants that the trees are taking out because they're very effective at removing the air, or the particles from the air, and then dropping it to the soil. So now you've got a soil problem. The, the, the particles not going, the piece of lead is not removed from the system, it's just transferred from the air to the soil. So now if you're going to do urban agriculture, or try to go prop <coughs> to do things with the soils, so you have to consider that the, the pollutants just, just ch change position for some of the particles. But they are fairly effective at removing <coughs> pollution. Trees that are over, sorry, it's an English unit, it's 30, 76 centimeters in diameter versus uh, less than trees, less than seven centimeters in diameter, remove about 70 times more pollution than, a large tree moves about 70 times more pollution than a small tree because the leaf area is 70 times greater. More capacity to capture the particles, more capacity to capture the gases. So big trees are a lot, this is what you're seeing right there for the London plane trees, do a lot more than small trees. We estimate in the US, 700,000 tons of pollution removed. But in basically what we've then done, if, if, you, if you remove pollution from the atmosphere, you have a certain boundary layer height from the atmosphere, which then changes the concentration. If tree, the tree removal reduces the concentration of the pollution in the atmosphere, it affects human health. Particularly for particulate matter and ozone, it improves, uh, reduces the number of deaths, cases of asthma, respiratory symptoms. The idea is we're living in this space where we have to breathe. The more we can clean the air, the better off we'd have in terms of relating to human health. Uh, you don't already mentioned this too, they had that one slide. We need to consider there are times when the trees might actually increase concentrations. In this case, it could create a tunneling effect. 
the pollution is trapped more within this. It's not allowing the pollutions to disperse. It's trapped in that area. So if you're walking along that roadside, even though the forest is reducing pollution overall, at local spots, it might be increasing the concentrations. This is the question if you want to make, maybe make bicycle trails and keep the cars off. This would be a great site to walk through and live if there weren't the cars. The problem is the emission source is right at the same spot where we breathe from those autom automobile tailpipes. And we have to understand where it's coming from and who's breathing that pollutant in. Number two, socioeconomic and aesthetics. People like trees. A lot of people alluded to this earlier. The question of tourism, stimulating business. People will, will um, stay around areas longer and shop more in areas that are more aesthetically pleasing. If they like the environment, people's patterns of cortisol and stress reduction. Our bodies react to seeing vegetation. This is huge. And as, as Johan was saying, there's a lot more research going into this about bodies react, our pe people's reactions to seeing the vegetation. Um, but it also has to do with design of commerce in many ways. If you make environments, if you want to bring jobs in or uh, <coughs> tourism in or people to shop, making the environment more aesthetically pleasing will bring the people and they'll stay longer. Number one, and again, this is from an, probably an American perspective. So I said this yesterday, people in Ireland said, well, we don't care about cooler air temperatures. <laughs> But temperature is key in, in city systems. And the question is, you show this too on heat islands. When you warm the environment, which we do because we burn fossil fuels, because we put impervious surfaces down, this has a huge impact on energy use and on human health. And the more we can cool the environment down, the better off we will be. We did a model uh, run with the US EPA and our, from our side trying to look at the effects of trees on air quality, which looked at pollution removal and everything else. And we also you had to tie into this air temperatures. Because if I reduce temperatures, I reduce emissions from cities. And the one thing are, are the EPA, they didn't care about pollution removal. The most, I mean, they did a little bit. The one thing the engineers uh, really stuck to was the temperature reduction. By changing temperatures of cities from one to two degrees had huge implications for ozone production and emissions of pollution. They said, of anything they wanted to do, if they got us to one, to one degree temperature reduction in cities, that's a massive change in air quality. Because it affects so many other things that are associated with temperatures. Even the trees are associated. As temperatures change, the trees react differently. So this, this graphic shows basically as temperature goes up, we tend to have more ozone being produced. Because of more emissions, the photochemistry changes, the boundary layer conditions change. So it ties back into that. Again, power demand is associated with temperatures particularly in, in our country. As, as temperatures go up, we tend to burn more fuels to reduce energy. So in addition to temperature reduction, we also have energy conservation. And this goes both ways, both winter and summertime. And you have to be careful, particularly here in Ireland, probably the same with the northern United States is, I think, Johan, you had the slide of shade. You have shade going on, which if you shade a building in the summertime, it's a good thing. It, it cools the building down. If you shade a building in the wintertime, heating costs go up. So you have to be careful on shade. You have the temperature effect, which is predominantly a summertime effect, which is good. But then you also have blocking of winter winds. Again, you were talking, the one who was talking about the, uh, the more the wind speeds generate through the city, the more we have to heat our buildings because the air is infiltrating into the building. So how do we design cities with vegetation in the wintertime to block the winds in summertime to shade the buildings? But you have to be careful in the wintertime not to shade the buildings. And this is important. People think when this came up yesterday is that uh, trees out of leaf it won't be an issue, but it is somewhat of an issue. Trees in leaf, the deciduous tree in leaf, will block anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of the light going through, which is great in the summertime. So then in the wintertime it drops their leaves. That tree is still probably blocking between 30 to 40 percent of that radiation hitting that building. So a tree out of leaf on the south side of your building is actually increasing your energy use. Even though you're seeing more of the sky view, it's blocking a lot of that radiation that would have hit the building to warm it up. So we have to be careful about designs in the wintertime. Again, if we reduce energy use, we design smartly with where we place our trees, we reduce energy use, we reduce the emissions from power plants, which then affect air quality, so it ripples back in. It's all a system approach. We estimate <coughs> $7.8 billion saved in our country, but in addition to that, another $2.2 billion of health effects, because if I reduce energy use, I don't emit CO2, I don't emit particles from the power plants. It all ties back into that, so there's secondary effects. 
And these are the, the emissions that are going on from our country. So particulate matter, methane, nitrogen oxide, sulfur, VOCs, they're all given off by our power plants, which then feeds back into human health. These are numbers from our country. The bottom line, which is probably comparable to what you'd have over here, you're talking about $1,900 per hectare of tree cover just for those few things that we can look at is energy use, pollution removal, carbon, and avoided emissions. But if you look at it, I had 10 on my list. Johan and, and Christy showed many others, regulatory services and others that aren't even on this list. And we're already start, we're starting at a base point of $1,900 per hectare of tree cover per year of services being provided by the forest, which is going to go higher if we could quantify UV radiation, if we could quantify the water better, if we could quantify the aesthetics, which we can't put values on them yet. So that's your base point of what the value of that forest is coming back. So just lastly, we'll talk briefly about iTree, and then I'll finish. That, that's it for me. But uh, I appreciate being here because we've been having discussions the last few days. iTree is a free public domain tool. Um, we're releasing a version for the UK in November. We are working on a European version, but it's going to take us at least a year or two. It has to do with data differences. The model will function here in Ireland. The problem is your data systems, when we look to your pollution data, it's not formatted the same as ours. So we have to reformat the data to load it into the system. But the concept behind this is basically what I talked about earlier, structure, function, value. The hope is people in Dublin or Ireland or wherever you're going to be will measure something about a tree, put those measurements into the system, and we can quantify back the ecosystem services provided by the trees and provide the values. It has been used worldwide. We have over 60,000 users in various countries. It's just more difficult to work outside now the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, or Australia, where we have versions that automatically work. There are a suite of tools, some of them alluded to. You can assess canopy cover. You can assess your trees, street trees, any area. If you just measure trees, can go into this. We have a hydrologic model that can look at water flows. Mm -hmm. I encourage you to look at the website. It's itreetools.org, and you can try the tools out. Uh, these are the benefits on the top are the ones that we're already quantifying, the ones in the green down to the bottom, like such as cooler air temperatures, UV radiation, wildlife, and things like that. We're already working on now. They're just not out yet. This model's been in development for over 20 years, and it's going to keep you in development. We have a new forecast model to it, which we think is really cool. It's coming out in November. If you have data for Dublin, so say uh, in these 10,000 trees, you can load them in there and then do projections forward of what the services will provide over a certain number of years, you decide. You can grow the trees and kill them off. It's up to you, but it'll sh show future events. Again, there's Tinney's numbers, again, and Gerald had this. So you have about 10,000 trees just in that city center you're talking about that provide services to people. That's 6% tree cover. So there's a series of tools. If you want to look at what the forest is worth, you can use those tools, how much canopy cover. You can use canopy, trees to plant, to remove. What we're trying to do, the concept behind this model in the original development is if I could only, if I could ask, answer, it's trying to answer one question. If I could only plant one tree in the city, in Dublin, what would I plant and where would I plant it? And now also, when would I plant it, if you take into time series? And that's what we're trying to answer. And that question becomes in the context of what do you care about in Dublin? So what to plant and where to plant it depends on what problems you have and where you exist. So if I'm worried about air quality, I might plant over here and do this species. If I'm worried about water, it might be over here. So the model is trying to be open source, basically allow you to make, we don't know what your problem is in Dublin, nor in London, nor anywhere. But we know the problems are universally consistent. They just might vary at different levels. So the answer to the question, the program will ask you, what, let's look at your data. Here's what you have. Here's where you're going to be. What do you want to have? And we're trying to build an optimization routine that says, like, given the data you have and given that you really are concerned about air quality or water, we will recommend species, we'll recommend locations, and then we're going to be recommending when to plant. And that's the idea of trying to future out. You have what you have today. Get the discussions going about where do you want to be 30, 50 years from now and start making the smart decisions. And climate change is going to mess this up in some ways. This, the trees you're planting today might not be the same trees you're going to be planting 50 years from now if the climates are going to change. So it's, it's a system that's evolving. So we need to keep up and you need to keep, need to keep uh, maintaining data sets. So and I, I think what you're doing a great job is you're doing the tree cover mapping. You're starting to collect data on the trees. This gives you the discussion point where you can have more intelligent discussions about the future. So that's all I have, but I encourage you to facilitate discussions. <laughs>